Okay, guys, we are now into the language portion of our notes. So uh, in the previous videos, we watched uh, information on mental representations and concepts. And then we also uh, talked about decision making. So in this video, we're going to talk about something that's innately tied to our thoughts, which is our language. Um, one of the things we'll talk about is that we it's almost impossible from our understanding to think without language. Um, and how language developed over time is really important, both in terms of an evolutionary perspective and also, uh, you know, how we develop into language acquisition. Um, so our objectives this time around are going to be pretty straightforward, but also, again, as always, a little complicated. Uh, so our objectives are going to be that we're going to look at the building blocks of language and, uh, you know, at least start a debate over whether non-human animals can have language or do have language. Um, we'll talk about key brain regions uh, that deal with uh, language processes. And then we'll talk about the roles of nature and nurture uh, in our language acquisition and basically do that by looking at two big figures here, uh, Skinner and Chomsky um, and their contributions to the field of linguistics and psycholinguistics and all that stuff. So let's start with uh, a, a very kind of basic but important question. Is language uniquely human? Um, we know that almost all animals communicate in some way um, and can share information that is important to them, um, whether that's, you know, uh, body language or, uh, you know, some sort of expressive uh, vocalization or, you know, something else related to uh, conveying information. We know that animals do that. Uh, unfortunately, my dogs are not home right now. Otherwise, I could maybe show you, uh, you know, how we can understand how they communicate to us. Um, but, you know, this is pretty straightforward, right? If, if, say, a dog wants our attention, maybe they'll bark at us. Um, if they, or they'll sit in front of us and stare at us longingly, you know, when it's, when they think it's time for dinner or something like that. Um, so we know that non-human animals communicate. Um, they certainly communicate with each other, right? Sometimes when my dogs are playing, one gets a little too much and uh, the other puts him in his place, uh, right? That's clearly communication. Um, but is it language? And really, what's the difference between language and communication? As we'll see, language is a lot more complicated, um, it is governed by a set of rules, um, and we have to look at the, the smallest units that we can within language to understand really the difference between um, language and other forms of communication. Um, so let's start by looking at uh, the smallest level of uh, kind of understanding in terms of the building blocks of language. Um, Humans have a lot of different um, levels of organization with regarding our language. Um, and while all are needed to complete language in a, in a full sense, um, they are kind of independent of each other. So we'll be able to kind of look at them individually uh, and then kind of build on top of them. Um, and uh, some people, depending on, on uh, learning differences or, or, or traumas or things like that, um, might have difficulty with certain aspects of these individually. That doesn't mean that they can't grasp language as a whole, but that they're just struggling with uh, one of these many different parts. So let's start with the most basic. Remember that language, as far as we're concerned, we're almost always speaking of spoken language. Written language is important, but it's a different skill, right? It's something that needs to be learned, whereas language itself seems to be pretty innate, right? You don't necessarily have to learn how to speak English if you're raised in an English speaking household, it just kind of comes naturally to you. So how do we understand this? Well, languages all have phonemes, okay? Uh, a phoneme is the smallest uh, unit of sound in a language. So it is the distinct sounds that can be used alone or within or in combination with other sounds. So when we're breaking languages down, right, we're doing that 
if we're doing it by sound, right, then we can get back into the individual like you know, phonemes, the the sound components. Um, so you know, each word that I'm saying is comprised of many different phonemes, right? The word phoneme has a bunch, right? F, a, m, e, m, as right phonemes. Um, it sounds weird when you spell it out that way, but that's kind of how it works. Um, different languages have different numbers of phonemes. Uh, in fact, uh, in West Africa, where language most likely developed, they have the greatest number of phonemes, things that we wouldn't even recognize as phonemes, things like clicks or whistles or, or uh, intonations even. Um, you know, that, that a word set at a different pitch uh, means different things. And the farther you get away from Africa, uh, West Africa, the number of phonemes drops uh, so that uh, at the other extreme of, you know, some of these West African, um, you know, Bantu languages or, or other, you know, Swahili based languages, um, some have over a hundred phonemes. Whereas at the other extreme, Hawaiian, the native language of native Hawaiians only has 13 phonemes. So very, very different at the farther away you get from Africa. Um, you know, if you've ever wondered why Hawaiian words are like super long uh, and kind of have repeating things, it's because they only have 13 phonemes that they only produce 13 sounds, right? 13 distinct sounds. So in order to create new words, you just have to keep adding on to them. Uh, so that's a phoneme, the smallest unit of sound in a language. Morphemes, on the other hand, are the smallest units in a language that act as symbols for meaning. So morphemes a lot of times are uh, words, but they don't have to be words. They can be prefixes and suffixes, right? Something that changes the meaning, right? Walked is different, has a different meaning than walking, um, right? There's something that happened in the past, something that's happening now. Um, you know, I will walk later. That, that's something that's going to happen in the future. So, um, you know, it's not just words. It's also prefixes and suffixes that oftentimes are related, are, are morphemes, right? In fact, right, if we're looking at morphemes, right, there's two morphemes in that word. Uh, there's morpheme, which is the smallest unit of meaning there, and also the S, which means that there's more than one, right? There's multiple layers of meaning within that word. Um, so a phoneme is the smallest unit of sound, a morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning, and then grammar provides the rules that we have to combine morphemes into uh, meaningful sentences. So these are things like subject verb agreement. Um, does the object of a verb come before or after the verb itself, right? So, um, yeah, or adjectives, right? Think of uh, Spanish, if you if you are romance languages, right, adjectives typically go after the noun that they're describing. So it would be car red, right, coche rojo instead of red car, right, which is how we do it in English. That's a grammar rule. Um, that's what allows us to to understand uh, each other. So phonemes, smallest unit of sound. Morphemes, smallest unit of meaning. Grammar the rules that combine morphemes into, uh, you know, larger, more meaningful sentences. So again, if we're looking at this in English, uh, basic sounds in English, we have about 40 phonemes in English. Uh, and that includes, you know, both, uh, I guess what they're, if my memory is correct, diphthongs and, you know, combination letters like sh, uh, you know, that, that is a single sound. Um, in fact, some of those sounds used to have their own letters, uh, oddly enough. The uh, thane, I think it was, thon, thane, uh, it was basically a TH sound. Um, oh, I have a story about that. Uh, actually, yeah, we're, we're, here's story time. So uh, if you've ever seen like old timey uh, store shops that are called like ye old supply store or ye old cottage or something like that, um, the ye, the, the Y there, um, so English used to have a letter, again, I think it was called a thon, uh, or thane or something like that, that was a TH sound, right? Cause th is a pretty common sound in English. So they, 
use one letter to make that sound. Um, we kind of got rid of those as, as time went on. But uh, so initially that looked basically like an upside down Y um, and you pronounced it with a TH. But as time went on, as standardized type became a thing, they the closest looking letter to the th was a Y. So the upside down Y became an upside or right side up Y. Um, and that's where you see these old timey places called like ye old or ye country store or something like that. It actually was supposed to be pronounced like the country store that the Y was supposed to represent the TH sound. Um, and it did for, you know, a hundred years or so before it stopped and people started reading the Y as its own letter and not, you know, basically inferring the TH sound. So uh, that's another thing that we should point out. Languages change over time. They're constantly evolving. Um, spoken languages change a lot um, and can change a lot in a short amount of time. It's why we have different accents. It's why, you know, the British call things uh, different words than we do, right? Like the, the, like a truck versus a lorry or the trunk of your car, they call the boot, right? Or little things like that, right? Well, well what is, what's going on, right? What, how does that happen? Well, there's just language evolves and different places call things differently, even if they're speaking the same language. So that was a long tangent. I felt like we were back in the classroom there. Sorry. So phonemes uh, are the basic sounds in a language, right? You can think of it as phone, right? Phonos is Greek for, for sound, right? Telephone, right? You speak on the phone. Um, we don't speak on the phone anymore. Sorry, I'm getting very distracted here, guys. Uh, so phonemes are the basic sounds in a, in a language. English has about 40 of them. Some, again, have over hundreds. Hawaiian has 13. Morphemes uh, are the smallest meaningful units, right? So again, these are... Uh, suffixes, prefixes, um, words themselves. So in English, there's about 100,000 different morphemes. If we're talking words in English, there's almost 300,000 words in English, right? So a combination of morphemes that makes sense to us. If we talk about phrases, we're upwards of over 300,000 phrases uh, composed of two or more words. And sentences, we're talking infinite, right? There's an infinite combination of words and sentences um, that we can uh, arrange um, in the English language. So it's kind of neat to see how something that can start with as basic as just 40 different sounds can lead to kind of an infinite combination of things that, that make the most sense. So just like morphemes and phonemes are basic units, we can take grammar, which we know as the system of rules that a language enables us to understand and communicate uh, effectively. We know that grammar can also be broken down into two things. One is called semantics, one is called syntax. So uh, these are important for you to know and people confuse them all the time. So let's let's try to be clear with our, our definitions here. Let's try to use, it's always ironic when we're talking about understanding language because it's how we communicate. Anyway, all right, so semantics are a set of rules by which we define, derive meaning from morphemes, words, and sentences. So uh, semantics governs things like adding ed in English to a verb means that it happened in the past. Not all languages have past tense. Um, it has to be inferred from context. Um, but in English, we do have that semantic rule saying that adding ed, right, to, to walked, as I used it before, means that that's something that happened previously, right? It could have happened three seconds ago or it could have happened three months ago. Um, but the ED uh, is a semantic rule saying that we have to then, you know, that adds meaning to, uh, you know, the, the words and phrases that we're using. Syntax is more uh, related to um, rules that allow us to have what we would call grammatically sensible sentences. So whenever you're looking at grammar rules, that's more likely than not going to be a syntax thing or a syntactical thing than it would be a semantic thing. So, um, you know, again, the example I gave before is in English, adjectives come before the nouns, but in Spanish, they come after the nouns. Um, that's syntax, right? That's just 
how we understand things. If, if, you know, instead of saying, you know, the white house, if I said the house white, you'd be very confused. Maybe you would think that it's some sort of, uh, you know, family with the last name white and it's the house, right? It's the house white. And it's all the people that maybe who knows, right? It's, it's different. Um, than what we're used to. And that's because in English, we have very clear syntactical rules um, regarding adjectives and their placements. In fact, there's this thing I saw online and I'm, I'm gonna butcher it, but there's actually like an order to how we do that. So like if I'm talking about like an, like an old smelly used gym shoe, right? There's, there's rules that talk about, you know, that why we don't say that it's a, a, a smelly gym used old shoe, right? Like that sounds weird. Um, in fact, it was hard to even just come up with that, but you know, an, an old smelly used gym shoe, like there's the order that we put the adjectives actually mean something in English too. Um, I'll try to find that and post that on, on Schoology so that you can kind of review it. It's pretty interesting. Okay, let's just because we've already done some of this before, let's dive right into uh, language in the brain. Uh, and then we'll probably call this video uh, a wrap since we're getting a little up there in time. So we know that language is, is mostly localized in the left hemisphere of our brain. And we already know that there are two types of uh, aphasias, right, that, that deal with the inability to uh, understand or, or produce language. We know the Broca's area, which is in the frontal cortex uh, on the left hemisphere for most people, is the part of the brain that allows us to produce speech. So people with Broca's aphasia, right, the, the issue with language in Broca's area, um, prevents you from speaking uh, what I guess we call fluently. Um, they have difficulty producing the phonemes necessary to speak. Um, their words make sense. And they can understand language fairly easily as well, um, just as easily as everyone else. But they just have a hard time, you know, actually making the sounds with their mouths, right? This is a, a motor issue, if you will, right? And again, we contrast that with Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is difficulty using morphemes. So we have difficulty using, you know, words that make sense. So, uh, you know, remember people with Wernicke's aphasia, typically speak fine. They can speak at a normal cadence and volume, and but it's just gibberish. Uh, and they also have a hard time understanding language too. So they might not know what questions are being asked of them, right? Language just becomes this kind of like mystery thing. Um, so we've already covered that in the bio unit. So this is just kind of like the, the quick reminder of uh, where language resides in the brain. Um, but I think this is a, a good time for us to, to stop here. Um, and as we get into, you know, non-human animals and language uh that can be its own video which will um you know will be posted after this one um all right so in this video we talked about uh language uh slight uh, we teased the idea of the differences between language and communication we talked about the smallest units of understanding phonemes uh morphemes grammar syntax semantics uh, and the parts of the brain that, that respond to the different uh, aspects of language, both producing language and understanding language. Uh, so yeah, that's it for this video. Uh, until next time, guys, I'll see you then.